1977. In a strange, desolate, industrial world, a pencil factory worker called Henry receives some alarming news that he's gotten his girlfriend pregnant and that she's somehow already given birth to something. Suddenly, Henry's world is turned upside down and his life begins to descend into an existential nightmare until eventually all traces of his small, simple existence are erased. Join me as we continue our journey through the mind and body as we discuss David Lynch's surrealist debut masterpiece, Eraserhead. Cut them up like regular chickens? Sure, just cut them up like regular chickens. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. You're really jumping into the deep end with this one. Uh, in this podcast, we explore the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our journey through the mind and body in horror cinema, and this is part seven in which we are delving into the mind of David Lynch. We're going to be covering a lot of Lynch films over the next few weeks throughout the series. And of course, this is the first biggie. This is his debut film, Eraserhead. We will be talking about this film in depth, so I would say spoiler alert, although this film, you know, I don't know how much you can really spoil Eraserhead. Uh, you kind of just have to see it to experience it. Um, but we've got a lot to discuss. We've got a lot to try and unpick as we try and figure out what the hell this film is really about. Uh, so let's get into it. There's so much to cover and I'm so excited to explore this film in depth. Joining me to discuss a razor head, I've got a brand new guest. I'm so excited to have her here and I also want to thank her for her bravery because of all of the films to discuss on your first ever episode of the podcast, I mean she's really taken the plunge here so I want to thank her and applaud her for that. Uh, she is a horror lover, podcaster, writer and co-host of The Thirst Podcast. It is my great pleasure to welcome Steph McKenna. Hello Steph. Hello, how are you? I am very good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. Uh, just again, just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm based in sunny Norwich and by day I work for a literature charity called the National Centre for Writing. And we explore the artistic and social power of creative writing and translation. So a lot of the projects we work on support new voices and new stories and they help writers develop their craft at all stages really and as part of that I'm the co-host of a podcast called The Writing Life with my colleague Simon and we interview writers and translators from all walks of life and talk about how they got into writing, uh, approaches cool. to method, it's very yeah it's really really cool we've spoken to game writers and screenwriters, crime writers, bit of everything really. Um, outside of work I'm the co-host of a pop culture podcast called The Thirst and we mostly talk about music and film film and TV, news and reviews, and we also dissect some bigger topics. So everything from the best of teen high school films to cancel culture and whether you can separate art from artist. Oh, and, that classic debate. Yeah, yeah a bit, <laughs> little bit tricky. Yeah, those sorts of things. Um, I also pull a lot of my own interests in there. So big horror fan. We've discussed Stephen King adaptations. Uh, we did a deep dive into Twin Peaks The Return, horror movies oh. of the past 10 years. Yeah, so just pick and choose all my favourite bits, really. And my co-host, April, isn't a horror fan, so I think it's been quite a little <laughs> experience for her. I think she's getting into it now. <laughs> it's something quite satisfying, isn't there, as a horror fan to, like, lure new people into this world and introduce oh, them to horror films? I've definitely convinced her, I think. I've shown her that there's, yeah, there's a lot to be gotten out of these films so uh yeah it's been a lot of fun um so that was gonna be my next question to you you're a big horror fan are you have you kind of always been is, are you a lifelong fan uh yeah i would say so definitely i remember books were my first love always i was a massive bookworm and i was that weird little kid that became obsessed with this witch book series when i was in primary school and then i was a goosebumps fan and a point oh. horror fan oh. and then yeah all of the classics and then yeah. uh, my interest definitely spread into films and music in my early teens and there was always 
you know, if there was a musician that mentioned a horror film or a director as an influence, I'd definitely go and instantly check it out and try it. Um, at university, I devoted, I studied English literature, but I devoted a lot of time to studying monstrous women and offspring in the gothic and horror fiction. So, oh, cool. yeah, so I wrote about Bram Stoker and uh, yeah, monstrous children. So books like William Blatty's The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby, things like that. Um, and I also started reading Stephen King, which is, I still regard myself as like a a kingophile in training, I guess, slowly working my way through the books and the adaptations and everything. Oh, uh, very cool. Yeah. That's great. How, did you watch the recent Doctor Sleep adaptation? I did. Have you seen it yet? I what did. did you think? I, do you know, when I read the book, when it first came out, I wasn't a fan. I don't think it's a very strong book. And going yeah. into the film, really apprehensive, didn't think it would be able to blend Kubrick and King and keep everyone happy at all. And I thought he really pulled it off. Mike Flanagan's... Unbelievable. Just yeah. such a strong film, the storytelling and just the strength of the characters in that film. It's just yeah. such perfect storytelling to me. It really is. It's just wonderful, isn't it? I think if you... I think that's it. You've got to go in in the right mindset, haven't you? You've got to go in not thinking this is going to be another Stanley Kubrick's The Shining or, you know, that it's going to in any way kind of... It's so different, isn't it? I mean, really, you, you, it might as well not even be a Shining sequel. And I think as long as you kind of have that in your mind, yeah. then you're going to enjoy it. It's I, so good. It's it so much is. fun. You can't be too precious about being yeah a Kubrick Shining fan or a King fan but I do think yeah. it balances both in a way that I just didn't think would be possible without being really yeah. crap so yeah that's lovely yeah you're so right do you remember what your sort of first gateway into horror was what your earliest experience was so my very I think my earliest memory of watching a horror film was watching Scream with my cousin when I think I was about nice. 10. She'd borrowed it from her brother next door, who's a huge horror film fan. He works for Arrow Film now. And uh, oh, yeah, cool. we were graffitiing her bedroom walls uh, because the parents weren't around. I don't know how much trouble she got in for us doing that. But we were watching Scream at the same time. So I was using painting the walls as, as an excuse to avoid the bits that were like, excruciatingly scary for me and <laughs> just being like I'm cool this is fine yeah really into this this is great so I think Scream was like my earliest my earliest memory and that was kind of yeah I must have been 10 wasn't that far after it was released um, and I used to tape all of the especially it was teen slasher films obviously being a child of the 90s teen slasher films taping them on VHS tapes off the telly like all the really crap ones like urban legend and re-watching yes. them over and over again i know what you did last <laughs> summer all of those uh yeah absolute oh. joys uh and i just pushed myself to see how much i could tolerate really it's yeah, a challenge yeah. isn't it when you're younger it is it is a challenge and i think so many of us have that same story probably a load of us are a similar age group now because the more and more yeah. people i speak to it's the same as me scream was my way in as well and then those kind of <laughs> 90 slashes and they're quite a nice easy way in in a way they aren't are. they because they're kind of they're frightening but they're not too frightening and, yeah, and, and it's exactly. good to then kind of like you said kind of keep testing your limits and see how far you can go beyond that <laughs> yeah and look up the history and go backwards and yeah exactly exactly some of the stuff we're doing this series actually is some of the more and the most extreme end of horror. How how are you with that kind of stuff? Have you got a good stomach for for the more extreme ends of horror? I don't I don't think I do. My um <laughs> yeah. my first reaction when uh, I agreed to do this was yay a razor head, amazing. But I thought our oh, mind and body, particularly body horror, it's not always my cup of tea. I sort of instantly thought of. Cronenberg, who's great, but yeah. I was thinking of like Hellraiser and Human mm -hmm. Centipede and things of very <laughs> violent bodily transformation, really, and kind of practical effects. But actually, some of my favourite horror films could easily fall into this category. So, as I said before, I'm really interested in sort of the monstrous female and the representation of female bodies in literature and film and the ways that female bodies are viewed with sort of fear and repulsion. So, mm. films like Carrie, for example, um, just, yeah, so glad that you're covering Carrie in this, in this season. Oh, yeah. So, I think the more I thought about it, and I think, as you've said before as well, you know, genres and subgenres, they're not static. They, you know, films move yeah. between them and uh, coming of age in particular as well. So coming of age yeah. body horror, even the ones that aren't 
great, like ginger snaps and teeth and things Ooh, like that. Yeah, it's great. Just, Raw as yeah, well. Raw's Raw great. is a brilliant film. Really loved yeah. that. And even yeah. um, I was thinking like films like It Follows and The Witch, like you've got this... You've got this scary, monstrous old hag in the woods, but also you've got Thomas in becoming a woman, and you know yes. her family are scared of that. So yeah. actually, body horror. When I started to think about it, became yeah. I realised that I probably enjoy a bit more of it than I think, but the more extreme, as in violent end, is probably yeah. not my favourite. <laughs> yeah, me too. To be honest, I'm right there with you. And and, and actually, body horror does make me quite squeamish yeah, like yeah. I loved I loved Raw but even Raw I found quite difficult in places really to really difficult you know? to watch it is <laughs> yeah. it is it's that lack of control isn't it it's mm. your body's your body's yours and it's the most familiar thing that you have and yeah. the idea of it becoming alien or monstrous or beyond your control is just terrifying it's yeah, horrible yeah yeah definitely and and you've mentioned David Cronenberg and that's mm. who we're kind of getting on to next week but this week we, we, we're kind of introducing David Lynch into we this are. conversation now and 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 actually funnily enough kind of I, I always consider in my head David Lynch to be much more on the sort of psychological end mm. dreams and the subconscious and all that but actually this film is completely body horror really isn't it I almost forget that before and then re-watching it again last night I thought yeah Eraserhead is actually pretty quintessential body horror in it, a lot of ways it is it's disgusting you know it's I mean it's not just a very <laughs> deformed horrible baby but there's you know bodies doing really unusual frightening things that people you know out of the blue that people can't seem to control and it is yeah. very physical as you say I you yeah. always think of David Lynch and you think of yeah, the, the dreamlike sequences and the confusing narratives and the psychological elements, as you say. But the, yeah, the body horror in this and I guess Elephant Man afterwards as well. They seemed, yeah. the earlier films seemed, yeah, particularly, yeah, more body horror centric, I guess. Yeah, squishier. Squishy, bit squishy. <laughs> Bit, squishy yeah put your hands in it a bit nasty <laughs> yeah totally uh, there was something actually um a guest i had a couple of weeks ago pamela hutchinson who who mentioned that moment that she hates the most in a razor head is just a, a moment where the woman rubs her eye in oh, bed and you hear that noise like that scratchy it's like yeah. dry but also wet like oh, yeah it is horrible horrible horrible, horrible. Oh, um so let me start off this conversation then by talking about David Lynch. Now, mm. we've mentioned him a whole bunch of times already on this series, but this is the first time we're kind of deep diving into a Lynch film. Mm. So to, to start off with a very open and very difficult question in a way, um, Steph, who who is David Lynch? What kind of filmmaker is he? How would you describe David Lynch in terms of his filmmaking? Ooh, Good luck. Where do you begin? I know, thank you. I did think you're yeah. going to pose a few difficult questions uh, in this episode. <laughs> I guess when most film fans hear the term surrealist filmmaker, they would think of David Lynch in the first mm. instance. To my mind, he's easily uh, one of the most important and influential directors of our time. He's known for making films in particular that feel surreal or dreamlike quite nightmarish and eerie and they don't always follow a clear narrative sometimes uh makes them quite hard to be categorized or explained um yeah. yeah i think it's quite hard to decipher your own feelings towards david lynch's films as well i you know i my automatic response is oh i love those films but also i don't know if i always enjoy watching them it's <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's I, I can't quite pin down my feelings towards David Lynch's films at all. I can enjoy them and feel disgusted by them and on edge by them all at the same time, really. Um, and and he's a director and a filmmaker who has done so many other things as well. So he's a painter and a musician and a singer and a mm. photographer and an actor and just you name it, he's done it, really. And his influence is... I mean, it just, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but his influence just, it just seeps into everything. Ideas are the number one best thing going. And ideas uh, come to us. We don't um, really create an idea. We just catch them like fish. Um, no chef ever takes credit uh, for making the fish. It's just preparing the fish. So you get an idea and it is like a seed. And in your mind, the idea is seen and felt and it explodes like uh, it's got electricity and light connected to it. 
and it has all the images and the feeling, and it's like in an instant you know the idea, in an instant. Then the thing is translating that to some medium. It could be a film idea or a painting idea or a furniture idea. It doesn't matter. It wants to be something. It's a seed for something. So the whole thing is translating that idea to a medium. And in the case of film, it takes a long time and you always need to go back and, and stay true to that idea. Keep checking that idea. And what you realize is the idea is more than you realize. And if you're true to it, when the work is finished and some years go by, you can even get more out of it, out of it if you've been true to the idea in the first place. I think you're so right, actually, what you said about how, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out whether or not you really do enjoy a David Lynch film because yeah. I I love him. He's pretty much my yeah. favourite filmmaker in I the world. Me and, too. And yeah, and I, and I love his movies and I especially love going back to them a second, third, fourth time. The first time I watch something new by David Lynch, I am always kind of baffled and a bit frustrated by mm -hmm. it i'm like oh what what is this and you know sometimes it's like the twin peaks the return you know it's like suddenly going back to seeing something david lynch has made something new after a big gap i almost forget sometimes how kind of strange and oblique and 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 long and drawn out yeah. some of his works are you know and you go oh my god but then it's only when you kind of let it ruminate in your head for a while or you come back to it or you talk about it that you realise how brilliant it is a lot of the time. Yeah, Twin Peaks The Return is such a great example because I think I went into that not thinking I didn't have any expectations, but I obviously yeah. did. Yeah. But then <laughs> what I experienced was not what I thought it was going to be at all, but at the same yeah. time was everything I thought it would be. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with you. Again, the Twin Peaks The Return is exactly that. It was kind of partly exactly what you should expect from David Lynch, but yeah. also it was the polar opposite. You know, I think we all thought coming into The Return that we knew what to expect from Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. It's been 30 years of us kind of feeling warm, nostalgic memories towards it of kind of so coffee much. and cherry pie yeah. and the kind of the kooky kind of characters and the music and that kind of jazzy music. Yeah. And suddenly the return happened and none of those things are there. It was like yeah. the the comedy had kind of gone. A lot of the fun characters had gone. It was kind of muted. Loads of the major elements were missing. Most of it wasn't even set in Twin Peaks. And yeah. It was kind of like, it took me a long time to go, what is this that I'm watching? You know? Yeah, we didn't. I mean, I haven't seen it. I need to rewatch it. I haven't seen it since it first came out but I remember sitting there thinking where do any rec you know when do any recognizable characters arrive and yeah, I reached a point yeah. and we were like maybe they're just never going to turn up maybe this entire yeah. season is just going to be completely new people you just yeah and it was a cl the closest experience to a razor head that I've had in a David Lynch well, kind of creation for ages as well. Definitely. I think um, it's been a while since I've rewatched A Razorhead, but rewatching it last night, I went, oh my God, of course. Like, there are so many nods to lots of his other movies, but mm -hmm. also, but definitely Twin Peaks The Return. As in, yeah. like, there, was, there were lots of moments within this that I thought mm. he's drawn on again in Twin yeah. Peaks The Return in a really kind of full circle way, I think, which is... Yeah, he's gone back to the beginning, hasn't he? Yeah, it? which has been really, really interesting. I agree with you as well that he is... Obviously, I think most people will think of surrealism. Mm. Um, the, do you know the word Lynchian is actually now in the Oxford Dictionary? So, is it? Uh, yeah, I think it was in 2018. They kind of... They added a whole bunch of words that all related to um directorial styles so oh. the word kubrican went into the dictionary uh, yeah. and tarantino-esque was added to the dictionary and lynchian <laughs> so those three uh which i think is amazing but that's brilliant um, in the di i know and how do you how do you dis like kind of boil david lynch down to a simple definition but they they basically they've written that it is kind of mixing the mundane with the surreal um, essentially, uh, and then adding in kind of dreamlike imagery and that kind of thing, yeah. which I guess kind of sums it up because if you look at all of his films, they start off 
seeming, I mean, maybe not a razor head, but maybe from Blue Velvet onwards, they start off seeming like they take place in a familiar world, in a kind of familiar genre. Yeah. Blue Velvet sets itself up as a classic mystery, doesn't it? Mulholland Drive is like a an L.A. noir. Obviously, Twin Peaks is this kind of whodunit. Um but what they do is then they slowly start introducing surreal elements to these otherwise everyday mundane realities. So a ceiling fan will suddenly look very ominous or um, a character is speaking in quite a strange way or dialogue might seem somehow stilted. So everything is just a little bit off. It's the classic sense of the uncanny, I think. Um, And all of these films and TV shows of David Lynch's, they'll start off seeming like they're one thing, but then they will slowly start to unravel and they'll become something else. And they do that by creeping in that surrealist imagery, I suppose. And it's a really weird thing, I think, when you watch it, isn't it? You're you're sat there in a very uncomfortable place because you, you're thinking, I don't really know what I'm watching. I don't know where this is going and I don't know how to feel about it, you know? Yeah, it's like a twisted soap opera in a lot of yes. ways. And it is yes. that making the mundane or the domestic quite eerie or macabre yeah i always think about how he sort of he films depictions of sort of apple pie america you know they often have a very 50s aesthetic and you know it's all very recognizable as you say and not Mm. very extraordinary but then something violent or dark or surreal happens and often happens in the daylight as well yeah and it just throws you for it just knocks you and you just you don't know what you're watching as you say you have these expectations and then it's just something completely different so yeah Yeah. that is very very lynchian and and mood and atmosphere actually as well is the biggest thing for me is it's art that doesn't prioritize well not all the time but for me it it doesn't necessarily prioritize story or meaning or explanation so it's more what you do with a feeling or a reaction to what you see and what you hear so it's it's yeah for me it's mood and as- atmosphere first and foremost his um he often talks about his favorite movie of all time being the wizard of oz which yes. is quite interesting isn't it because mm. in some ways obviously the wizard of oz totally the epitome of kind of mainstream in a way, mm-hmm. but it is also this quite interesting um, kind of... Uh, du- there's this interesting duality, I suppose, in The Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz, in that it starts off in a murky, sepia, kind of quote-unquote real world before it then goes into this uh, dream world. Yeah. yeah, technicolor dreamland, where everything is a little bit different to the real to the real life and she's there's that moment at the end of the wizard of oz where dorothy wakes up and she sees all of the people from the, her adventure yeah. are kind of regular people in the village and she goes yeah. oh you were there and you were there and you were there and i guess that is in a lot of ways what david lynch does it, the, the, he kind of there are there are many many films where people have kind of dual roles they might be playing one person in a kind of dream fantasy reality and one person in another reality and i guess it's a bit less straightforward and cut and dry than The Wizard of Oz, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but I think a lot of his movies do juggle with that kind of idea of duality, the real world versus a fantasy world or a dream or a nightmare or whatever it might be, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's that bleeding between dream and reality, isn't it? It's it's often nightmarish. It's often, you know, it, it feels like a hallucination. You can't distinguish the two. It often happens with sound as well. So you'll have a a sound in a in what you think is a dream sequence seems to bleed through into what you think is a waking scene and you kind of think oh, where is this where is this music coming from and can the characters hear the music is it happening in the scene or is it, it yeah it's it's a blending together really isn't it it's amazing and so before we obviously a razorhead was his first feature film mm. he like you said he started off his career as a painter he was a painter mm-hmm. and he was an artist and there's this amazing story i've told it already but he he you know was looking at his painting one day and the light was hitting it through the curtain and the <laughs> greens suddenly started to move and he suddenly thought to himself oh a moving painting and then, <laughs> and then that was sort of how he became a filmmaker which i think is perfect and kind of perfect for david lynch isn't it this idea I of just that 
before. I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's an amazing clip. I will play it to you at some point because it, it's just so fun. I love listening to him talk because he talks in such a unique way in interviews Ooh, as well, doesn't he? What it? a voice as what well. What a voice. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> so yeah, he then started dabbling with kind of experimental films and he, he did all these kind of short films in his early career that's just like five people getting sick and like oh, another one with an old lady and they're they're completely bonkers. They are. And again, they are more like pieces of art or paintings that move essentially aren't they have you have you kind of seen any of those early films i've seen yeah i've seen some of them is is it the alphabet song or something something with the alphabet in it yeah that is yeah yeah like a lady in bed and it's it's that's terrifying really creepy children's voices Mm -hmm. just absolute nightmare material i would say like very intense (laughs) absolutely and actually that leads me to a a good next question is that do you consider david lynch a horror filmmaker in any way I yeah I I I do and I don't I think mm. you wouldn't define all of Lynch's films as horror films but then again I'm not sure what you would define them as you get elements <laughs> yeah. of film noir uh, psychological horror but if horror is a genre that often elicits fear and anxiety and discomfort and repulsion then there's absolutely horrific elements in pretty much all of his films maybe yeah. not the straight story but that's yeah. that's a bit more wholesome uh but you know Mulholland Drive Lost Highway there are some terrifying moments in them and but yeah. a razor head in particular for me is absolutely a horror film I would argue it that it's, it's debatable of course with something like Mulholland Drive but a razor head it's a pure horror film right isn't it it is a it's a nightmare from start to finish <laughs> Did you and Mary have sexual intercourse? Why? Did you? Why are you asking me this question? I have a very good reason. And now I want you to tell me. I'm very... uh, I love Mary. Henry, I asked you if you and Mary had sexual intercourse. Mary? Mother! Answer me. I'm too nervous. As a baby. It's at the hospital. Mom! And you're the father. But that's impossible. It's only... Mother, they're still not sure it is a baby. It's premature, but there's a baby. After the two of you are married, which should be very soon, you can pick the baby up. As best you can, Steph, tell us a little brief synopsis of what a razor head is about. How dare you make me attempt this? It is, <laughs> it's so much yeah. of it defies explanation. And yet there's yeah. almost a limitless number of explanations that can be given to it as well. So yeah. Yeah. I would say in a place, somewhere in a place that might be real or it might not be reality at all, or it might be Mm. on this earth or it might not be on this earth. Mm -hmm. We've got a man called Henry who's played by Jack Nance. uh, And I keep, one thing I've got to try not to do actually is I keep interchanging Henry and Jack's names. So you might have to correct me if I do that at any (laughs) point, but he's on vacation from his job at the printing factory, which sounds fun. And he finds out that his girlfriend or the girl that he's been seeing, Mary, um, has given birth to a baby that is horrifically deformed, so deformed that it doesn't even look human. And the couple are forced to marry and move in together by Mary's parents. And they're struggling to cope with caring for this baby together. And it's constantly crying so much so that Mary leaves and Henry is often left to care for this baby alone. Uh, and then, <laughs> then I was trying to think of the ele- other elements that come into it. So he's he's visited either liter- literally or in his dreams, who knows, by the lady in the radiator in his room. Uh, and he also seems to maybe, or maybe it's a fantasy, have a, a relationship in some way with the the sexy lady next door, the sexy neighbour. Uh, and then I guess the film is interspersed with some very, very abstract scenes, but it all kind of culminates in him murdering his baby. Yeah. Ta-da! That's the end. I, I think that's an excellent, excellent synopsis. Very good work. Thank you very much. Uh, I tried my best. <laughs> You did a brilliant job. Um, So, first of all, what do you think of this film? Do you like it? Well, 
are there's certainly not many films like this in existence i don't think uh it certainly elicits a weird mixture of fascination and repulsion and confusion and also humor actually in me a lot i think as i said there's so much of it that defies explanation but and just when you think you've got a handle on it you enter into a sequence that's so utterly surreal and nightmarish that you kind of lose your place completely yes. um I'm aware that like a lot of people have tried to intellectualize this film or give explanations for it. And I don't know, I don't know whether I'm actually that interested in doing that. I haven't spent a lot of time trying to decipher it. Uh, it doesn't feel right somehow. It doesn't, doesn't feel like I should be doing this to this film. And I certainly, I think we all know that David Lynch would rather we didn't try and interpret his films in too much yes. of a detailed way. Um, <laughs> And it's a film, personally, that I had to build myself up to as well. It wasn't one of the first films, not one of the first David Lynch films uh, I saw. And I had a very I had a very visceral reaction to it to begin with. And in subsequent viewings, I don't know, I've warmed to it in a very weird way. Yeah. Can you feel warm towards this film? 100%. I, I am exactly the same. I think I saw it, I, like, like with you, it wasn't my first Lynch film. I think I'd seen some of the more more palatable and more accessible ones yep. to begin with I had seen yep. Twin Peaks and I think I'd seen Blue Velvet so mm -hmm. then going from that to a razor head was like whoa holy shit what am I watching you know yeah and I think it was it was baffling the first time I saw it but then I've watched it maybe three or four times now mm -hmm. and I think I love it more and more and more every time I watch it and yeah. maybe that's just kind of knowing what you're in for so that you yeah. can just enjoy it for what it is actually I think really helps yeah there um, might be a safety element there as well you know what yeah. to expect yeah, I think so. And it's just, it is creepy, but like you said, it's really funny as well. I find myself laughing at it more and more when I watch it again and again, you know? it's There's some genuinely laugh out loud moments, I think, in this film. There is. I don't know... I don't know whether sometimes I'm laughing because I don't really know what else to do with myself. But some yes. of it is genuinely very funny as well. Yes, <laughs> it's a exactly. Bit of both. Exactly, yeah. Um, and uh, you're right. I think it probably... It, it, it shouldn't be... Um, unpicked in the way that we should go this is what this is really mm -hmm. about or this mm -hmm. is what this means because that probably isn't the point of it although I would say in some ways in my head this film is very very simple it is a film about David Lynch uh, being scared of becoming a father I mean I would oh, yeah. say it's, it's pretty much as simple as that isn't it yeah. really that he got his partner pregnant and he made this film which is I think an, like basically a nightmare of an expectant father really I would say that that's all it is yeah, absolutely. I think, did his wife just say that he was a quote unquote reluctant father? So it wasn't that he was yeah. a, you know, it's not that he, he was a bad father or he didn't want mm -hmm. to be a father, but he was, mm -hmm. yeah, reluctant. I think it came at yeah. a time where they they weren't quite expecting it. I think they got married afterwards, didn't they? And they just moved to LA. Yes. So, uh, yeah, but I think you're completely right. If you, the, if you boiled it down to its kind of simplest themes, it's... Yeah, it's the slightly fearful of parenthood. Um, it's approaches to sex as well. So a sort yeah. of a fascination and a repulsion with sex. Um, and also just a fear of domesticity. Like, I don't know, living, having to live in a domestic situation and the kind of yeah. trappings of that as well. And I guess they're the three themes that really pop out to me. Um, me too. They might not me too. completely form a coherent explanation. There are a million other elements. And I tried to... I honestly, I tried to read someone's sort of psychoanalytic approach to this film and my head almost exploded. It was like too much for me to even, I was like, wow, this is clever, but I can't even get into it. So yeah, I think I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think it's, I think that's all it is at, at its most fundamental level. And of course there is loads of other stuff going on in this film, but it's filled to the brim with, like you said, repulsion at not just the kind of fatherhood and domesticity, but also sex. There are loads of scenes that just involve like things bleeding or orifices or phallic <laughs> things that or in some way look horrific and nightmarish as well, right? It's just that surely is what this film is all about, I think. Yeah, there are like literal sperms falling down from the <laughs> ceiling. Like it, it's <laughs> grotesque, but yeah, it makes Henry seems to be fearful or fascinated and repulsed by sex but the film as a whole seems to present sex as quite a I don't know a bit of a cold industrial mechanic kind of thing but also yes. yeah just a bit eerie and gross it's not yeah. a sexy film 
It's, it's about it, film. Oh my God. It's about it's sex, really but it's not a sexy film. It kind of feels like an anti-sex film yeah. in some ways, doesn't it? I, I think um, it's almost like you could show it to, in schools about like, pregnancy, about say, pregnancy warnings, you know. That's like uh, a sex yeah, ed class, I, I, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's oh my God. Imagine that. That's my kind of sex ed class. I love Put it. Put me off forever. Uh, yeah, exactly. And actually, what do you make of, again, I, I said, you know, we can't explain these things, but I'm now mm. going to ask you to explain it. But what's going on in that first <laughs> scene? There is that first scene, which oh. I think might be some kind of abstract way of showing sex. That's what it seems to me. Like we, we see this kind of like planet in outer space and we see what looks like this giant sperm kind of come out of Jack's or Henry's mouth. That's and, the one, yeah. Uh, shoot out of something. And then we see that guy kind of pull a lever as if something is at ramping up or something is starting uh i kind of thought exactly like you said a kind of almost industrial way of showing a sex scene or something like that yeah. i don't know what, what yeah. did you make of it i think i i do completely agree with you it's yeah. it's the sort of very abstract surreal imagery but you know you have literally got long stringy intestinal style sperm like things <laughs> dropping yeah. into wet round puddles so i'm not really sure yeah. how else you could explain that but the the man in the planet yeah as you say he kind of it almost seems like he pulls the levers to make that conception happen like it's the the yes. conception of the baby but yeah. also like he is i don't know like he's the one in control of jack's uh, Jack Henry keep doing that Henry's life that he's pulling the lever of Henry's life and kind of I don't know forming his fate really for yes. him have you ever seen that that it's quite a terrible film from the late 80s early 90s called look who's talking with John Travolta no, no. it's basically a story about it's basically like a rom-com but it's 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 about a baby and Bruce Willis like kind of voices the baby so they oh, kind no. of have no, no, no. these kids oh. but they have adults kind of doing a sort of internal monologue of of these babies anyway it like starts with literally kind of the opening credit sequence happens inside a womb and you see sperms kind of flying towards this egg and uh they're all voiced by bruce willis it's very disturbing but i kind of thought yeah like it this is kind of a David Lynch version of that scene of kind of sperms heading towards an egg and impregnating somebody, essentially. That's what it so, feels like. So what you're saying is Look Who's Talking was influenced by David Lynch's A Razor Head. Exactly. exactly. Amazing. The parallels. <laughs> exactly. Um, so then we get into the kind of main crux of the story. And I guess, first of all, I want to ask you, we've touched upon it already, but... Let's talk about the look of this film then, the look, the cinematography, the production design, because it's so striking and in some ways so different to everything else Lynch has done. Uh, that black and white, that kind of industrial noise. What do you make of the look of this film? Oh, it's a bloody nightmare. It's like a dystopian, industrial, mechanic, cold world the the black and white as you say it already it already places like a distance between you and the scenes that you're watching it already feels very otherworldly because it's in black and white and then yeah that industrial landscape is one of the most striking first things that you see you kind of meet henry as he's coming home from work and he's walking past all of these factories and this abandoned industrial wasteland uh which doesn't it isn't just where he works it appears to be his home so this is his domestic setting as well and you've got that horrible industrial hum in the background and boarded up houses and you don't see anyone else Lynch has always been fascinated by industrial landscapes. He's like a keen photographer and he's done a lot of photography of factories in Europe and he talks about their kind of the dreamlike quality. I think he said if he could choose between Disneyland and a factory, he knows which one he'd go to and it's not <laughs> it's not Disneyland. Um, so yeah, he seems to be fascinated by by the man-made and how it kind of... It, its relationship to nature as well because you get all those weird plants inside Henry's house that are yeah. dead or dying and you know piles yeah. of dirt and it's kind of nature and the man-made seeping into each other um but it's a yeah it's just completely devoid of hope really it's yeah. it's a horrible place to be um I know. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it feels like in some ways when you hear David Lynch talk about yeah machines and factories 
he kind of loves it and he thinks it's kind of beautiful but there's nothing beautiful about the way that this l- landscape is portrayed like in my in my opinion this feels like a kind of it feels like a hell doesn't it like you said it is like a hell on earth and that's happened because of industrialization and machinery and factories um it's like that kind of william blake thing of kind of like the 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 sort of innocence of the countryside has been corrupted or something it just feels like it's just like the horror of machinery because i think going forward like with lynch's other work with twin peaks and he kind of looks at obviously kind of suburban America as one thing, but also he looks at kind of nature and the woods and he yeah. loves all of that stuff as well, doesn't he? Um, but with this, it really feels like we're in some sort of hell. Yeah, we're in some sort of futuristic dystopian hell. There's a it picture does. that uh, There's a picture that Henry has on his wall of a nuclear, there's of a uh, mushroom cloud. Oh, yeah. And it almost feels yeah. like we're in a, a post-apocalyptic, you know, like a like an atomic bomb's gone off or something. That's almost what it feels like. Like we're watching threads. But or we've, something. it's wiped everyone else out. Yeah, and these are the only people left. Especially Mary's house. I think that might be her parents' house. Might be the most horrific set piece in that film. It's like oh next to the railway tracks, and it's moving, and there's steam, yeah. and it's it's just horrible. Really, it's yeah. the constant noise. Um, I, I don't know how anyone gets any sleep. They don't sleep in this film, do they? They're up no. the entire night. But it's as you say, it just it doesn't end. And even when Henry enters his apartment in one of those early scenes when he first arrives in his apartment and gets in the lift, he looks so unnerved. You think yeah. when you get home, you'd you know go into your apartment door or whatever and you'd feel like, oh, I'm home, it's great. He never looks at ease at all. He is constantly no. terrified. Yeah, he is. It's like his face is like stuck. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got that big hair. It's almost like a kind of cartoon character of somebody that's in shock, but the yeah. entire time, isn't but it? But they've you know, been electrocuted in the factory yeah. and his hair's <laughs> gone just kaboom. Exactly. And it is weird, like you say, that he... He kind of tries to, you, you almost get the feeling that nature is so sparse in this world that mm. he kind of clings on to anything he can. So he he picks up that little maggoty worm yeah. thing and he keeps it as like a little pet. And uh, he has plants next to his bed that aren't, yeah, like you said, they're not even in a pot or anything. It's just like a mound of dirt. He's just dug the them plants. up like the, yeah, like he's <laughs> yeah. he's come across one and he's so, you know, he's he's got no time to do anything, you know, find a pot. He's got to grab it and bring it home with him and put it in his chest of drawers. And yeah. it's just, yeah. Yeah, as you say, it's like all other people and all other life has just disappeared. And I think that's where this is a bit different to most of other Lynch's work, which because we talked about how a lot of his other films, whether it's Blue Velvet or Twin Peaks or Mulholland Drive or Lost Highway, they at least kind of start off in a world that's recognisable yeah. as our own, don't they? Absolutely. Whereas this one, I've got a feeling this isn't even supposed to be set in our world or our planet or whatever we want to call it you know i i don't think it is i really don't mm. i i i even though i can't quite decipher what's real life and what's not i yeah. don't feel like this is a specific period of time i yeah, yeah i can't I, I can't place it in where it's yeah. supposed to be it doesn't it feels totally otherworldly to me yeah exactly um is it ultimately just is it ultimately just a nightmare do we think because it's kind of filled with nightmare logic and things that mm. can't really be explained and time jumps around is this essentially just a nightmare i wonder is it as simple as that he could yeah he could be dreaming the whole thing there's kind of yeah. you know especially with the lady in the radiator you think like it i mean that's either a dream or it could be his subconscious like who knows what's going on it's all bleeding <laughs> yeah. together it could just be they could have had like a shower a, a dream a a scene at the end where he just wakes up and it's all a dream and it's all <laughs> yeah. over. But yeah, it it, exactly. it doesn't. Yeah, if it is reality in any any kind of way, I hope I never have to be be oh near it. Even him looking at that radiator freaks me out. I just thought oh. I don't want to go anywhere near that radiator. It looks horrible. Like I know. Do you know what and I mean? The noises, the noises that come from it as well. I mean, the sound design is really incredible, and I think it's partly what creates most of the horror in this film isn't it it's that mm-hmm. constant kind of drone in the background that constant kind of machinery whirring the noises of kind of steam of the radiator and then like we talked about earlier the kind of bodily noises whether it's rubbing an eye or somebody eating something or whatever um it's horrific sound design isn't it it is it is and yeah when the when the industrial noise stops the baby starts crying and it just it's just layer upon layer of sound. And I think um, Lynch and his sound 
director, a uh, designer, sorry. They spent like a really long time on this film and they it seemed to have quite a DIY ethic as in they, you know, they literally put like a microphone in a bottle and dropped it in the bath to see what would happen. Like, Love and it. built up all of these layers of sort of horrible abstract noises that you can't quite place and kind of place them over and over. And they seem to spend a very long time focusing on the sound in this film. And it's something that, I, I definitely take the sound. That's the most memorable part for me. It kind of haunts me afterwards, especially that song. <laughs> in heaven, it's just in my head for about four days afterwards. In heaven, everything is fine. In heaven, everything is fine. In heaven. That, that song kind of sums it up, doesn't it? It sums up Lynch, really, because it's kind of, in some ways, mm-hmm. that should be a sort of happy song or a peaceful song or something, but it's also really, really creepy. It's got that uncanny quality to it, doesn't it, I think? Yeah, sort of sung by the girl next door who looks very sweet uh, mm. and very approachable and very cute, but I don't trust her at all. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I think she might be evil. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, he they they did spend absolutely. You know, they actually spent years making this film, right? David Lynch and his team. They they spent several actual years putting this film together, which is really incredible. But I think you can see it in the detail of every piece of production design, every single piece of sound design. Like you say, every element in this film has been designed and thought over. It feels like, doesn't it? Yeah, everything is considered in this film mm. and probably every Lynch creation afterwards. I just, if you can read anything out of a razor head or any of his works, you can guarantee it was deliberately put there. There's, there's no yeah. accidents. It's yeah, yeah. It sounds like it was hell in itself to even make this film in some ways mm. because it took so long. Uh, yeah. But yeah, what you got out of it was something that was very, very carefully crafted. Yeah. Extraordinary. Um, let's talk about Jack Nance then. And I suppose yeah. the, and I suppose all of the performances in this... Now, going forward, Lynch does have a... a, a um, there is a kind of recognisable Lynchian performance, I think, mm-hmm. which is quite sort of over the top. Again, think mm-hmm. of all those ca- soap opera characters in Twin Peaks yeah. or, um, or Dennis Hopper in Blue Velvet, these quite extreme performances. Yeah. Um, but what kind of performances do we get here in A Razorhead? I mean... <sighs> I love I love Jack Nance who plays Henry so yeah. much. Who doesn't love Pete from Twin Peaks? Oh, amazing. Pete, uh, yeah. Wrapped in plastic. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and I yeah, you, his he's kind of the everyman really. He's almost the opposite. He's very quiet. He's very fatalistic. He doesn't seem to react to much at all. Yeah. Um, he doesn't say a lot. He he. Ex- I guess he expresses a lot with his face, but he doesn't say a lot at all. And mm. one of the only violent reactions he ever has is when uh, he's told that Mary's had a baby, and he has that sort of involuntary violent nosebleed. And that yes. for me was the only time that you kind of got a reaction out of him. Yeah, uh, he's very yeah. yeah. He's he's a very strange. Apart from the shock of hair. He could kind of be anyone. There's nothing yeah. very standout about him. And again, you can't help but think, is he a, some version of David Lynch? I mean, David yeah. Lynch has got quite big hair, right? He's yeah. always had quite tall, kind of bouffanty hair. And I wonder if it's, again, it feels like that kind of extreme version of, dreamlike version of him almost. Yeah. Uh, and you're right. I guess he is such a, a passive character, Henry. He's just somebody who has stuff happen to him it's just like stuff is put upon him he doesn't really do anything or actively make any decisions it feels like it's like a whole film of people kind of yeah doing things to him i suppose from beginning to end (laughs) mary's mary's parents tell him he's gonna get married now and he's like yep okay that seems to be that's my life made just yeah (laughs) as you say he is a perfectly passive character and but he he's the main character and everyone else almost feels like a a bit of a backdrop for him i guess but i find the 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 family setup of mary's family is fascinating it's like this i don't know it's like a loving but really 
oh, I don't know. It's it's just a really, it's a domestic family setting that's hideously bent out of shape. Yes, you're so right. Let's talk about that scene because I think this is my mm. favourite scene in the whole film, actually. I think it's I just, my favourite scene. I love it from beginning to end. It's weird. It's really funny. Like, this is the part that I think is like, yeah. laugh out loud funny in a it kind is. of um, creepy, uncanny way, but it's mm. so funny. And... Um, and it's just like, what is happening? Uh, this whole sequence. <laughs> so he obviously, he gets invited for dinner. He comes over, he meets the parents. Then they, they proceed to have dinner with these tiny little chickens that then start <laughs> bleeding. There's some sort of, possibly a grandmother that sat in the back in the kitchen, not really completely doing anything. Completely catatonic, just completely doesn't catatonic. move. Could be dead, who knows? <laughs> uh, at one point, the mother starts kind of convulsing when he's cutting up the chicken. She kind of seems like she might be maybe having some sort of orgasm or also yeah. being in pain or also yeah. being upset. Don't really know. Then when she tells him the news about being a father, she suddenly starts trying to kiss him and kiss his neck. Yeah, she's I mean, like the- licking his face. <laughs> Meanwhile, the dad is just staring blankly and smiling. It's like, it's the weirdest thing, but it's so mesmerizing and so funny and so interesting. It is. It's like meeting the parents for the first time, but in the most fucked up way possible. Really. <laughs> Mary tells me you're a very nice fellow. What do you do? Oh, oh, I'm on vacation. What did you do? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, I, I work at Lapel's factory. I'm a printer. Henry's very clever at printing. You've got that horrible setting, as I said before, with all the fans whirring and it's ramshackle and the lights are flicking on and off and reminds me very much of... It reminded me of the um, the apartment in Seven. It's like oh, yeah. Brad Pitt's apartment in Seven, which kind of shakes every time the trains go by. That sort of, I'm yes. sure that was a direct, again, direct influence. But yeah. it's, yeah, horrible, awkward dinner conversation where mary's dad is talking about his arm going numb and mm. that, yeah that he can't and he doesn't want to cut up the chickens because he's i think basically worried he's going to cut off his arm <laughs> yes, uh, and, and not feel it yeah yeah and these horrible they're man-made chickens aren't they he says that they're kind of yeah Ooh. probably yeah farm bred sort of industrial uh, industrial like farm made man-made chickens that are, yeah yeah they're wrong they're still alive they're bleeding they're squeaking it's oh and oh. and but, before Henry even finds out about the baby, he's watching their dog, which is which is nursing all of the puppies, and they're making this oh, sort yeah. of screeching noise and all kind of fighting for the for the milk together, and he looks kind of repulsed by it. And it's yeah, and as you say, he gets this out of the blue. There was definitely an agenda with this meeting because mm-hmm. the mum out of the blue asks him whether they've had whether Mary and Henry have had sex and he almost apologizes for it he's like really embarrassed yes. and he kind of says I'm yes. yeah I'm sorry like it's not it's not a normal situation at all and she's asking very probing personal questions <laughs> over and over again before licking his face as you <laughs> like fine that was her I don't know she's had like a dual reaction there and um yeah, yeah kind of uh, yeah weird family little bit sexy because mum's having a convulsion at the table and I think Mary does as well she has that one where her mum kind of brushes her hair to bring that her is, out of it that is so weird that yeah so that, weird. that feels very lynching to me because it's that classic everyday situation that is just bent horribly out of shape and becomes something <laughs> very uncanny and awful <laughs> cutting them up just cut them up like regular chickens That's it's yeah. one of the <laughs> best little... moments I just uh just cut them up like regular chickens? Sure, just cut them up like regular chickens. It's so good. And it, the way it just kind of moves its little legs as yeah, it bleeds. It's, it's just, kicking. oh, it's so, it's so weird. And then the moment when the mother and daughter leave and he's left with the dad. And again, it's kind of an almost recognisable moment where you, mm-hmm. you, the awkwardness of meeting the in-laws and then that moment when you're left to talk to the dad. Yeah. It's even more awkward, you yeah. know. And it's just that moment when the dad's like, so what do you know? Yeah. <laughs> just like, <leaves> <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> 
it's yeah i love it i love it it's like it, like you said, it's an everyday scene that has just been like stretched to to its most uncanny, absurd <laughs> level. Well, Henry, what do you know? Oh, I don't know much of anything. But yet, even then, their conversation, and this is something I'd describe as very Lynchian at all, their conversation is so stunted. It's not, oh, it doesn't yeah. naturally flow. There are these sort of weird pauses in between questions and answers. And it conversations never flow right in his films. They're always, and in Twin Peaks as well, actually. It's just, there's something not quite right about it at all times. I know. It's weird, isn't it? It's, it's, you never quite know with Lynch sometimes whether it's deliberate or not that everything can sometimes feel a bit wooden and a bit stilted yeah. but it's, it's is this bad acting all, yeah exactly is it just bad acting is is some of the writing just really cheesy and, yeah. and bad or is it but most of the time i'm sure it's deliberate in the in the way that so many of his films present a kind of fake world i suppose mm-hmm. a kind of fake veneer it's that it's that mechanical bird in blue velvet holding the yeah. worm isn't it it's that kind of like like really obvious artifice i suppose mm-hmm. in some ways mm-hmm. um and yeah you're right this this whole scene is filled with that and of course filled with body horror again isn't it you know going back to Ugh. the initial topic of our discussion is this is where the body horror really starts coming in from this scene whether it's the bleeding chicken or the nosebleed that henry has suddenly there's yeah. lots of there's lots of ickiness and blood and squishiness and the dogs that are like nursing and making those weird noises and all that kind of thing. It's like the horror starts creeping its way in at this yeah. point, doesn't it? That is, that's the starting point where it all starts <laughs> to feel a little, it's not just weird, it's a little bit gross as well. <laughs> yeah. And we're warned, of course, that she's had a baby and that the baby was very, very premature and that they're not even sure that it is a baby, <laughs> I think is what they say in the dialogue. <laughs> yeah. And you think, what the hell? Is... And then, what else has she we... given birth to? Yeah. I no, what else is it? And then, and then the next thing we see is I don't know how much time has passed, but suddenly she's moved into his little apartment. They're living together with this baby, uh, this iconic baby. Again, to this day, no one really knows how David Lynch made this baby, what it's made from, and how it moves and what it is, um, which is incredible. What do you think of this baby? Is it cute? Is it scary? Is it both? It is not, who, who thinks this baby is cute? I don't <laughs> understand. It doesn't even have any skin. Like it's not. It's not. It can't be cute. It's that early scene with um, Mary when she's when she's feeding it. When you first see the baby, and it's like spitting up food. Yeah. That's absolutely disgusting. It's so. It's so <laughs> creepy. And as you say, no one. No one knows what it is in there. As in what you know what, what it's made of. There's sort of. Mm speculation that it's some sort of animal carcass but then it also has these moving parts that you think you wouldn't be yeah. like how have you got that the eyes to roll and the mouth to move and it seems very sophisticated for something that could just be a i don't know it's very very strange but it's, it's really, yeah it's really it's really impressive actually like the little i think so. movements in all of it and it kind of pulsates and it looks kind of wet as well all the time it is Again, it yeah. looks quite organic it doesn't look like um, a puppet or something you know no doesn't look like a puppet doesn't look like a baby but <laughs> it's it's something wet and squishy and animal in in some kind i love mm. the fact that that's a mystery as well and i love that i think jack nance had nicknamed it spike or something like that so spike's the baby as we Brilliant. as we call it but it yeah it gets it gets sick and then it gets progressively uglier because it's then covered in these horrible <laughs> lumps and bumps and it's gurgling and sucking it sounds like it's suffocating when it's sick and its eyes roll around and i think i was really shocked at the fir- when the first when i first saw it actually because i didn't yeah. expect it to be as horrific as it was <laughs> I, I agree. It's really creepy, and actually, it just gets creepier. Like you say, the the 
the moment when it gets sick, when it suddenly becomes sick, where he goes, oh, you are sick. Oh. And it's like a jump scare. Yeah. Suddenly, when, when we cut back and there's that really loud chord of music as we see mm. that it's covered in all these sores and stuff. And uh, it is. It's the closest thing to this film has to a proper jump scare, that moment when it gets ill. But it's a really, it's gross, isn't it? It's a gross, creepy thing. It is. And you initially, you feel sorry for it because obviously yeah. it's horrifically deformed and it's not having a nice time. And also there are moments when when Mary's kind of, she's freaking out and she's upset because the baby won't stop crying. And I was bracing myself because I thought she's going to hit it or do something horrible to it. She's going to strike yeah. it. It's going to be violent. And then Henry later on, he kind of smothers its mouth, like tries to keep it quiet when the neighbor's coming in from next door. And, you know, the way they handle this baby, I feel awful for it. But yeah. at the same time, it's def- there are moments where it's definitely mocking Henry as well like oh, I actually love laughing laughs. at him <laughs> it's, manipula- <laughs> it's manipulating him like every time he tries to I mean not that you should be leaving the apartment when you've got a newborn baby anyway but yeah. tries to leave the apartment and the baby's like Wah! the second he like opens the door so he has to go back and that <laughs> yeah. baby is totally playing him at the same time <laughs> I do kind of feel a bit sorry for it though and I, oh, yeah. I do it's really sad when he does finally cut its bandages off and its organs <sighs> come kind of spilling out and again it's really creepy creepy and horrible but also i feel really sad for it i'm like oh god fix yeah. it <laughs> and it knows <laughs> what's coming spike. as well it's looking yeah. at him and it knows what he's about to do it's mm. yeah it's remarkably mature for a newborn baby like yeah. mind wise very wise it but knows it, yeah. stuff it knows stuff it uh, does <laughs> It, yeah, so there's that there's kind of the majority of the film now kind of takes place in this little apartment with mm-hmm. this baby obviously like you said she can't um she kind of reaches the end of her tether with it and there's that uh, amazing moment when she's like i'm leaving i'm going to stay at my parents <laughs> she tries to grab a suitcase from under she's the bed she's pulling it from under the bed and you're trying to work out what she's doing at first because it looks like she's just like hiding behind the bed and just rattling it or something and you're like what the hell is she doing and then yeah it is like comedy sketch she eventually gets this giant suitcase out from under it and you're like oh that's what you would do you look so weird what were you doing like another it's comedy so moment good. yeah pure comedy moment uh he's left on his own and then this these are where we get these moments where he escapes kind of his kind of hell uh that he's in to go behind the radiator Mm -hmm. and and interact with this woman who has a kind of big fat puffy squishy face and sort of dances on sort of sidesteps around on a stage squishes giant sperms and she sings (laughs) in heaven everything is fine um Steph, what's this about? What, what, what what's the <laughs> what's the woman behind the radiator all about? I don't know. She's horrific, isn't she? And as I said yeah. before, she 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 looks so cute, but you've got this yeah a horrifically malicious radiator that he's staring at for ages. And when he eventually gets there, yeah, there's this shy giggling woman. She's dancing across the stage, stepping on these sperms. I think they're sperms, and they explode into white goo. Um, and yeah, he visits her a few times and I mean, she's sort of a weird fantasy for him, but there is, people have also kind of theorised that she's his subconscious. So maybe she's the one trying to convince him to kill the baby, which is an interesting idea, I think. Uh, I Yeah, I wouldn't know what else to even try and get out of that. It's just, yeah, it is these moments of escape or into fantasy for him, which bleed into reality again. The the music, yeah. the organ music that he puts on at kind of the beginning of the film also seems to be right. playing when she's performing on stage and it, it waking and dreaming is all all of yeah, all of a blur. Yes, but all of a blur. Yeah. yeah. I think it is I think you're right. I always see it as some form of escapism. I always see it as yeah, like she whether it's his subconscious or whether it's just this representation of his um his temptation to escape to yeah. just get the fuck out yeah. kill his kill his baby and go back <laughs> to being go back to being a single bachelor again where he can go and talk to nice smiling women which she yeah. is a kind of like monstrous version of I suppose. yeah she's i guess she's supposed to be sort of the antithesis of the the neighbor next door 
Um, they're, they're, yeah. they're a big contrast there. You've got this sort of sexy, sultry lady who lives next door and then this very yeah. innocent girl next door. Um, but at the same time, yeah, she's... I don't trust her at all. I don't think she's crap like anything like you think no. she's going to be. Um, no. Especially with her, yeah, poor deformed paper mache cheeks. Exactly. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's again, it's that kind of... Um, that happy face that's been stretched to a monstrous extreme. Uh, and so you just, yeah, you just do not trust her whatsoever. Uh, the woman who lives across the hall as well, that's an interesting character. Who She only pops in a couple of times. And again, shes it feels like she's more there as just this alluring, again, escape for Henry, doesn't it? Like this kind of what he could have if he if he wasn't tied down by this wife and baby sort of thing yeah. or something like that. She looks, she reminds me a bit of Isabella Rossellini in Blue Velvet, doesn't she? So much so. I was going to, yeah. Yeah, going to say that that's sort of a the image of the kind of the, the sexy lady that he's kind of watching from a distance. That kind of voyeuristic quality definitely comes up again exactly. in Blue Velvet. Exactly. And she, yeah, and you're not quite sure. Do they ha- spend the night together when she finally comes over? Does that really yeah. happen, or is he imagining that? Um, yeah, she, yeah. He he's just a bit of a pervert, really, isn't he? In short, <laughs> yeah, he is, and in some ways, he's not the. You know, obviously he's in a pretty monstrous situation here but in some ways you could look at this film as being quite um you know very i suppose in some ways very obvious it's made by a dude in his 20s who's like (laughs) i want to live my life i want to do what i want to do i don't want to be tied down by a monstrous baby and a nagging wife and Mm. there is a there is an element of that to this film i suppose i think think there is jack nance is just so likable as well i think he's he's such a likable guy isn't he i'm so glad that he formed this relationship with lynch and they kind of carried on making so many films together and actually i think a lot of the other actors in this film and they've kind of gone on and done a lot more with lynch like you said there it starts to at this point in the film kind of even more so than before it becomes Mm. very difficult to know what's real and what's a fantasy by this point Um, Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden when the wife has left she's back again and that's when we have that really horrific moment where she's in the bed she's kind of grinding her teeth or making some weird clicking noise with her mouth which is horrific she rubs her Mm. eye and it makes that really loud noise and she has those sperm things kind of coming out (laughs) of her that yeah. he then throws against the wall and kills. And He's just he, violently throwing them, yeah. That is one of the most... That's, for me, one of the most horrific moments in the film, I think, that sequence with her in mm-hmm. the bed making all those noises. Because, it, again, it's, like, unexplainable and gross and squishy and nightmarish, you know? Yeah, just very... Yeah, sort of defies explanation, but you get that real sense of frustration and you get that yeah. sense of their... I mean, I don't think their relationship was... It didn't look like it was very put together from the start. They're kind of bickering from the very first moment that you see them where she's kind of saying, you're late. And he's like, well, I didn't know if you even wanted me. Like, it's a a dysfunctional relationship. But yeah, he's sort of throwing these... (laughs) these sperms angrily and destroying them like the lady in the radiator who's squishing them under her feet as well and it's all very visceral yeah. and yeah And then I guess the, the other major kind of set piece that we should discuss before we wrap up is the the titular eraser head moment, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. This incredible moment where it begins with him going behind the radiator, doesn't it? So he's with the woman behind the radiator and then that's when mm-hmm. his head suddenly comes off. And then pops it's off. that... In- it pops off and then we have that entire sequence involving a little boy finding his head and they put it through a factory into a machine and it becomes pencil erasers again what on earth is going on in this scene Uh, this is i honestly think i tried i watched this scene again earlier because i thought this is the one bit that i can't quite get a handle on so i'm sure if i watch it again i will magically have an explanation for this and funnily (laughs) enough i don't there is i don't know what's going on um, it does remind the bit with the the kid who picks up the head. It's like Oliver Twist. It makes yes. me think of Oliver Twist with Bill Sykes, <laughs> like he's running off with his head to go yes, back yes. to Bill Sykes. But yes. it's, uh, I don't know. It seems like it's a moment of climax, definitely, yeah. where all of this anxiety and you know the nightmare really reaches its peak and its intensity, and even the music yeah. increases in volume, and it's all 
yeah, as you say, it's all very displaced and abstract and there's these weird things coming into the scene and wheeling out and his head is kind of pushed up by, a again, another sort of phallic... Yes. Is it a penis? I don't know. It just yeah. I mean, it might as well off. be. It, it might is. as well be at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it and then it turns into the baby and it's screaming. And that scream reminded me of Laura Palmer's scream in Fire Walk with Me. Just that level yes. of intensity yes. and the reaction that I had to it, which was just to recoil and hope that it stops very very soon. Uh, <laughs> it just really reminded me so much of that moment. But is it again like? I, I just, I don't even know yeah. what to make of it. Have you got an explanation yeah. that you can just? No, <laughs> it's the, it's, it's, it's. You know what? It's the one scene that I can't even, I can't even begin to come nope. up with an explanation for it. It's it, it. How in any way does it link to everything <laughs> we've seen previously? I think you can come up with a reasonable explanation to the woman behind the radiator, yeah. to the woman that lives next door, to everything else. But this moment, I. What I mean, other than the fact that he works in a in a printing factory, uh, I don't know what the connection is between him and becoming a pencil, pencil. eraser. <laughs> I guess I mean that was the was wasn't that the first? So that David Lynch had a dream, didn't he? That's where Eraserhead came from. He had a dream that <laughs> either he had a pencil for a head or someone had a pencil for a head. Maybe he just thought like I've got to stick to this. You know, this was the original idea. I'm going to shove that in somewhere. But no, I honestly, other than having. A, a feeling of it, yeah, of anxiety and of it, the film really reaching its intensity and its peak. Yes. I don't really know what else to say about it. <laughs> and, and you're right, maybe it's, because it's the last moment really before we then get that final ending where he kills the baby and it's like, mm. it's like he's reached his rock bottom. It's almost yeah. like, I guess, I guess it's a, you could say it's literally the point where everything that was him has now been erased like he is he's, yeah he, you're tr- yeah the he has been destroyed by this baby and this what's mm. what's happened to his life it's completely it's literally erased every trace of him he becomes that kind of dust in the yeah. wind and uh yeah you've solved it i think you've solved you it that's I've it sol- i've solved eraser head um yep, and, there then, you go. and then because because really that's when he like you said he hit it it's at it's most horrific there and then it kind of leads us into that final climax where he decides to kill the baby. Um, mm. Which, again, does he even mean to kill it? Because really all he does is cuts his bandages off. Uh, yeah. Poor Spike. But it turns out that the bandages are holding all of his organs in place. So all of him just kind of spills out. What a horrible I know. scene. It's, oh, it's like cottage cheese isn't it that kind of <laughs> yes. oh it kind of ruptures Ooh. out you you expect it to be like blood like the rest of you know the other things that have bled in the film but it's this horrible yeah. frothy white gooey it, absolutely yeah. minging it really is but it <laughs> yeah and that that made me wonder actually is the baby even real because it was such a monster in terms yeah. of its sort of the way that it's been composed the way it's been put together and the fact that it doesn't seem to have any skin it's being held together by bandages is the baby even is it even real or is yeah. it is it real but is it deformed i don't even know it kind of it, yeah it's a, it's, it's a it's a truly horrific moment and then <laughs> and then it suddenly becomes sort of huge it goes giant there's that giant yep. head giant head yeah <laughs> uh, again uh, you know god knows it, again it's just <laughs> it's just turning this situation into the most monstrous version of what it can be i suppose mm-hmm. by this point um uh, yeah and it's it's an act that I mean, killing a baby really is. Is there anything worse that you can do on film? Killing exactly. a child, killing a baby. Yeah. I don't think there is. I think it's the big. It really is the big taboo that you it can't. Is. You can't kill a baby in a film, and I can't watch it. That's that. I mean, that makes it a horror film in and of itself, doesn't it? You yeah. can't having it to does. bear witness to that happening. Yeah. Exactly. Even with a baby as gross and grotesque as that baby is, it's still pretty disturbing to watch it die like that, mm. I think. To watch it suffer and die. Um, it grows into a giant thing. I <laughs> think it looks like it's going to attack him or something. And then the last thing we see is uh, Henry back with the lady behind the radiator mm. and they sort of embrace and everything fades to white. Almost like he's suddenly gone to heaven or something. Yeah. You know. Again, I guess it kind of lends to that theory that she is that kind of 
subconscious she's tempting him into killing it and now that he's mm. done it she can kind of embrace him and be happy or something I, I, yeah. who knows he's reached a moment of peace I guess yes. I, d- I don't yes. know I don't know what happens beyond that but uh, yeah, yeah it does seem like this white glowing moment of sort of yeah they embrace and everything is happy and you know yeah. in heaven everything is fine yeah exactly it's really disturbing though like you said because it kind of almost presents itself as this happy peaceful ending when we've just watched him horrifically kill his baby and that's murdered his own baby i know (laughs) good for him i'm glad it worked out yeah yeah it's uh oh god it's what a film what a film what an ending um at this point in the episode i want to quickly move over to our new regular segment wild about horror because i'm so keen to hear what freudian cinephile mary wilde thinks of this particular film so let's head over to wild about horror and hear mary's own freudian take on david lynch's a razorhead this series of evolution of horror is my favorite for so many reasons but mainly because of the big focus on david lynch this time round I'm excited to be contributing content on several of his films. He's a surrealist legend. Gonna start with Eraserhead, of course. Shot in black and white, it's his first feature length following several short films. The production was aided by the American Film Institute where Lynch was studying at the time. The project spends several years in principal photography because of funding difficulties. It eventually went on to gain popularity over long runs as a midnight movie. I once heard a rumor that when Stanley Kubrick was shooting The Shining, he regularly screened Eraserhead for his cast and crew as inspiration for the keyed up atmosphere he wanted to conjure up on the set. Spooky stuff, right? The story of Eraserhead revolves around Henry Spencer, who's left to care for his grossly deformed baby in a desolate industrial landscape. The child is depicted almost as inhuman a sperm-like thing. The scary sprog refuses food and cries incessantly. The baby is a very anxiety-inducing factor of the film, taking on effective horror dimensions. This small, vulnerable organism, whose needs are utterly unknowable, this taps into primordial fears connected to the bond between parents and children. After a sexual encounter with his beautiful neighbor, who incidentally looks a hell of a lot like Dorothy Valens in Blue Velvet, Henry has a vision, some kind of dream. The so-called Lady in the Radiator performs a song on an iconic Lynchian stage, and Henry is decapitated by a creature that looks like his child, revealing a stump underneath. Soon afterwards, Henry's head sinks into a pool of blood and falls from the sky. It's been proposed by some film writers that The Lady in the Radiator is Henry's subconscious, a manifestation of his own urge to kill his child. I think it could be a symbol of the principal character's conflicted relationship with his own inner child. Eraserhead is thought to have been inspired by Lynch's fear of fatherhood. His daughter Jennifer was born with severely clubbed feet, requiring extensive corrective surgery when she was young. Jennifer has said that her unexpected conception and birth defects were the basis for the film's themes. Eraserhead's tone was also shaped by Lynch's time living in a troubled neighborhood in Philadelphia, riddled with crime. So in the dream, the severed head falls down from the sky and a boy collects it. And then he goes to what seems to be a pencil factory where the head is used in the process of fabricating eraser tips. The connection here between the human head and the eraser could signify the removal of conscious thought from the mind, suggesting the entry into an unconscious field where the realm of awareness dissolves or is erased because of repression. Lynch has claimed that he relies on meditation to access ideas deep below the surface of conscious personality, and he's even written a book about the subject, Catching the Big Fish. He's exceptionally good at artistically depicting the logic of the unconscious, which initially seems confused, cryptic, impenetrable. But of course, psychoanalysts will tell you that we must learn to look beyond the manifest content of the dream and seek out the secret underlying meaning, described as the latent content of the dream. 
Contrary to the scientific opinions of his time, Sigmund Freud did not view dreams as meaningless, but instead as valid psychic phenomena, wish fulfillments, requiring integration into waking mental acts. Freud said that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. I like to think of cinema as functioning like a dream, where film material evokes subjective associations the same way that projective tests like the Rorschach inkblot do. Film interpretation helps to arrive at meaningful discoveries at the individual and collective levels. And David Lynch's films especially are great projective tests because they're so abstract and surrealistic. Talk again soon. A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde there. Uh, You can hear more of her regular segments uh, throughout the rest of this series. And if you want to check out more of Mary's stuff, follow her on Twitter at PsychStar for information about her courses. Uh, And you can also listen to her podcast that she presents with Sarah Cleaver, which is called The Projections Podcast. Um... Well, we're going to start to wrap things up on a raise ahead, but just for some final thoughts. I mean, Steph, what an incredible film. It's not the sort of thing that I think we can ever completely do justice. There's so much crammed into this movie, isn't there? So many ideas. It's just, it's so dense. It is. It's easily the most talked about David Lynch film ever. And you can mm. you can see why. You could talk about it forever, deconstruct it forever, or just mm. never deconstruct it. Like, who yes. needs, does it need an explanation? Maybe yeah, not. Exactly. Maybe it's just the untangling the different feelings that you have because I remember when I was really well I say really young when I was a teenager I was a big fan of Nine Inch Nails and they were you know into David Lynch referenced David Lynch a lot and Eraserhead was the one film uh the you know the images of Jack with his hair um came up all the time so I really wanted to watch Eraserhead and I tried as a teenager and it was like beyond my grasp it was too much (laughs) it made me I couldn't understand what it made me feel and it made me feel so uncomfortable and yeah it was only when I went back to it later that I was um, when I was a bit older that I thought you know I'm okay with not knowing exactly what this film means yes it's really interesting to interrogate my own feelings towards it actually yeah, it's, I it's a very interesting experience. Yeah, it is a really interesting experience. And it's a real experience. I think it's really important to... I mean, the DVD that I have of it actually even tells you at the beginning to calibrate your TV. Oh, so does it? it's at the right brightness and stuff, which I think is amazing. It's the only That's DVD amazing. I own that does that. Yeah, and... It really feels like you need to, you know, I turned down all of the lights in my flat and I had the volume up really loud because I was like, this this needs to, I, I feel like a razor head is a kind of sensory experience more than anything else, you know, and you've got to, you've got to just let it take you on this journey and just let it wash over you, I suppose. I think you're completely right. I think everyone should experience it. Can't say they'll all yeah. enjoy it, but uh, everyone <laughs> should give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, I mean, you you mentioned there Nine Inch Nails. I mean, interestingly, Nine Inch Nails do pop up in uh, Twin Peaks The Return, don't they? Yes! And they are in that incredible episode, episode eight, which I think is the most Eraserhead-like thing David Lynch has ever done since Eraserhead, right? Absolutely. It's that... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, episode eight comes completely out of the blue and it mm. is a series of... Yeah, so much of it is... It has a, a really non linear non-narrative structure you've got all of these flashes of images and it's black and white and it's yeah it's one of the best episodes of television ever easily but and again it's a it's very much an experience rather than a a story and it's yeah i'm i really need to watch it again actually because i just remember the feeling of watching that with friends because we tried to watch every episode together as a group and it was yeah. like what and then what the hell me yeah. jumping on the sofa with excitement when trent reznor appears and it's like oh my god <laughs> this is literally david lynch nine inch nails this is the peak it doesn't get this better is, for me yeah the dream and it is it really is um you know there's black and white imagery of nuclear bombs yeah, I was and say kind it was of a nuclear dystopian bomb, worlds and it really does feel like we're we're in a re- like we're it's like he's brought us back to the world of a razor head. And I feel like there is some kind of one day I'm going to make a video essay about it. There's there's this like idea that that all of his films could be almost set in the same universe in some th- weird way. You know, I think they could. And the, yeah. the the tall man, the giant reminds me so much of the man in the planet. And yeah, yeah I could totally see them existing in the same universe and being a yeah. part of the same world. You really, yeah, you're absolutely I, I think, right. I think when it comes to the, 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 his films and TV shows that the, 
that kind of take place in this other world because mm-hmm. yeah it's that other world it's the world where the giant lives in Twin Peaks it's the mm-hmm. same as w- wherever Lost Highway is Lost Highway yep. takes place in some weird in between place mm-hmm. uh, where there's that cabin and everything and um, yeah I think there's there's something really interesting there but I was going to ask you really just sort of as the final question like do you see Eraserhead's um, influence I suppose going forward not just on David Lynch's other work but just on other films or is it too unique to ever be repeated I mean it does feel unrepeatable but also mm. I think it has had an influence on so many artists not just on films but on music mm-hmm. as we've said and mm-hmm. everything I think it has yeah it's been so influential and I think you do re-watching it again this week I could see the threads and sort of images and themes that tie into other later films by Lynch and even things like in Henry's apartment in the lobby like the floor and you just think red room like yes you've yes, got yes. those images that come up and we spoke before about the the neighbor who kind of she seems very similar to Dorothy in Blue Velvet um yeah uh, the use of sound and kind of industrial noise always reminds me of the sawmill in Twin Peaks as well and yeah. I think you you definitely got themes and images that carry on through his work um and the more you rewatch them I think the more you pick up on them but yeah in terms of influence on other on other artists I mean <sighs> Yeah, there's the the story about Kubrick getting all of his team to watch A Razor Head before filming The Shining because he wanted to get that kind of atmosphere, which I love. That's great. And actually, you can... I can see the influence there. The Again, the scene where Henry goes into the apartment lobby and they're facing the lift reminds yes. me so much of the lift, you know, yes. the lift in The Shining in the yes. Overlook. Um, you can see those... You can see those parallels and I think... H.R. Geiger spoke a lot about kind of alien and the uh, the effect that a razor had on the shaping of that monster as well. Yeah, phallic, um, basically penis shaped. But yeah, lots of penises. That's the <laughs> that's the main takeaway. Um, <laughs> even recent films like The Lighthouse makes yes. me think of a razor head so much. It's that constant noise. It's the constant yes. lighthouse noise. Hundred percent. And, 100%. and the end actually with um we're all kind of when he goes up to the light and the lighthouse and it all kind of goes white and it's sort of white out and screaming and there, there's a, a moment at the end of a razor head with a man in the planet with his kind of he's smiling and his teeth are all grotesque and yeah. they yeah they feel one of the same you can yeah, i think so you can right. feel that influence everywhere yeah my god i didn't even think about that but the, the lighthouse is really overtly like taking a lot from a razor yeah. head actually isn't it in terms of the way it looks and sounds definitely yeah. yeah and you and it's black and white and you don't know what's you know there are some elements of that you don't you don't know what's real you don't know what's madness you don't know yeah, <laughs> yeah. if they're drunk and imagining it you don't know <laughs> if any of it happened it's kind of yeah, yeah. very similar vein yeah, it is. And, and, and that kind of weird um, juxtaposition of horror with sort of humour as well. I mean, The Lighthouse mm. has got loads of like fart gags and stuff in it as well. So <laughs> many fart gags. Really funny, really funny uh, seagull. I like yeah. to call White Philip. It's like the White yeah. Philip of, yeah, just yeah, yeah, so really true. funny. Like, yeah, oh, it's so That's good. Great. Yeah, yeah uh, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you can see it's influencing so much and David Lynch work absolutely it pops up again and again and again imagery from this it's a what a strong debut film i suppose oh, and uh, amazing to think that yeah the shining i mean amazing to think that potentially without a razor head we might not have had the shining you know and i'd i'd never thought of that like until i'd read that kind of anecdote about kubrick i hadn't thought of the parallels between those two films but it's so true well it's certainly a thing that kubrick has just like lynch where you're mm. it it's like mood is more important than um, mm-hmm. kind of conventional narrative, and I think that's the case exactly. with the shi- the Shining. I mean, what? No, what? I mean, they've literally made whole films about people trying to figure out what the Shining is yeah. about. Because <laughs> uh, again, it's more about the mood than it is about trying to understand it all. I suppose, and that's very Lynch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, amazing. So, and do you think it still holds up? Sort of, would you still recommend it to people today? Do you think? Oh the man, so much! I can't believe it was released in what 77 yeah it's just 43 years ago yeah 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 i don't want to say it's ahead of its time but it's just yeah there's nothing there hasn't been anything like it since Mm. and it's such a unique experience i would absolutely recommend it to everyone i mean i think it would be with the caveat that you watch it during the day perhaps (laughs) i have a (laughs) have a really horrible memory of 
wanting finishing Twin Peaks for the first time and wanting to watch Fire Walk with me. And no. my cousin, because I was borrowing his DVDs, said, yep, do that, but watch it at the weekend during the day. And I was like, yeah, of course, I'll do that. Took it back, went home, watched it at midnight by myself straight away. Couldn't sleep for about a week. Oh, Just, man. it's, yeah, don't watch it during the daytime and you'll front. feel a bit better for it, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's a fright. Uh, Fire Walk with me is a frightening film. Oh, my God. Terrifying. Um, Amazing. Steph, thank you so much for joining me. This has been such a pleasure. It's been great fun. I hope we've... I can't believe we've explained away all of a razor head. Oh, I mean, we've solved it. We've solved, solved it. it. Um, last, a final couple of questions for you then. First of all, what's your favourite horror film? The boring answer is that we've already discussed it and it is The Shining. That is... Nice. I know it's, it's it's just such a standard answer, isn't it? And I almost well, thought, no, like, oh, a- I shouldn't... There's a reason why it's a standard answer, though, because yeah. it's so good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I think watch it. I watched the film and read the book almost simultaneously when I was a teenager, and that that really was the book and the film that launched me into being a big Stephen King fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that it's a classic haunted house story, but it's equally a psychological horror about a man's descent. You know. Yeah from addiction into madness and it's a story yeah. of a family unraveling and I, oh, I'm just fascinated by it and I love as we've said before to sort of compare and contrast between King and Kubrick and even Mike Flanagan's sequel yeah. uh, I just it's it's it is iconic um it is you could talk about it forever it's brilliant but I mean, another film of, I was thinking of the last, more recently, of the last 10 years, one of my favourites that I keep going back to is It Follows. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Ah, oh, love that film so much. There's um, there's definitely a Lynchian mood to It Follows, I think, as well. I Almost think... dreamlike, you know? Yeah. Like the, the, the kind of, the world that it creates that's not really set in any particular time or place that we yeah. know of and recognise. There's something Lynchian about it. Feels, yeah, feels quite retro that it should be set in the yeah. 80s or something. Thing, but then you're not yeah. quite sure because they've got mobile phones and yeah, it's yeah. all really strange and I remember going into that film thinking this is going to be hilarious there's basically a ghost STI like this is just yeah. it's going to be so much fun and then came out thinking that was one of the most terrifying things I've watched <laughs> in a long time yeah. um, it's the slow moving threat and oh, so good. the disaster piece soundtrack as well is just tip top. So one absolutely. of my favourites absolutely uh, and final question for you then what's your scariest ever movie <laughs> I can't, I really struggle to pin down my scariest ever movie, but a movie that I saw in the last few years, which has scared me a lot as an adult, is The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, yeah, that is scary. Scared the pants off me. (laughs) So much so that when I listened to your episode about it, in the daylight, walking to work, I had to switch it off because I was like, (laughs) no, it just... Like no, I just can't deal with it. It's it's the it's the little bell, the toe bells ringing. It's the bell, the and he, he kept playing it in the episode, and I was like, I can't, I can't deal with this. It's too much, and it's. That is a sc- I mean, I forgot how scary it was, and I made my poor girlfriend Rihanna watch it with me for that episode. She discussed it with me, and she's not a horror fan. I Ooh. yeah, it was probably the closest she'd come to dumping me, me yeah. having made her watch that film because she was so terrified. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, terrifying. It's a great it's the, horror film. It's the bit at the end where he's trying to get out of the door and there's someone outside and they start singing and it no yeah. it just <laughs> don't i nope. can't even think about it no thank you uh amazing well steph thank you very much where can people find you out there on uh, social media and the internet and where can they come and find your podcast as well so you can find me on twitter at steph x mckenna and you can find uh my podcast the thirst at the thirst and the writing life podcast which is the podcast they do at work can be found at writer center amazing steph thank you so much for joining me thank you so much for having me And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brand new guest, Steph McKenna. What a pleasure to have Steph on the podcast and discussing such an impossible film. Um, Steph did an incredible job. So Steph, thank you and I hope you'll come back again very, very soon. Uh, So this is the point where I would genuinely love to hear your thoughts. What do you think a razor head is all about um what's with the woman in the radiator you know what's with that whole pencil eraser segment um what do you make of that family dinner scene what's really going on in this film who's the man in the planet 
I would love to hear your takes and your interpretations. Please do get in touch. You can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Letterboxd, and you can join the discussion group. That's where you can discuss a raise ahead or anything you like horror related with fellow listeners. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, and that can be found on Facebook. If you want to listen to extra weekly content, you can also support this podcast by signing up to our Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. And there, if you're able to donate a few dollars per month, you will get access to regular bonus content. If you're a $5 patron, you get a new episode every other week. And that could be anything from covering Buffy the Vampire Slayer to a new release to a scariest ever moments countdown. Uh, and if you sign up to our $10 level, you will also get access to our ex- exclusive mini seasons one of which focuses on the entirety of twin peaks speaking of david lynch next week we are going to be discussing the latter half of season two and that incredible finale Uh, so you can have access to all of this content by signing up to our patreon that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror you can find all previous episodes and seasons of this podcast on our website simply head over to evolutionofhorror.com and you can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Acast, Libsyn and Spotify. If you want to support this podcast but can't afford to financially support it through Patreon, a really great way to support us would be to leave us an Apple Podcasts review uh, and star rating, which really helps us get boosted in algorithms and helps us get discovered by new listeners. Okay, well, things are just going to get weirder and weirder from this point onwards because now we've done our introduction to David Lynch, next week we're moving on to David Cronenberg. Next week I'm going to be joined by the brilliant Mike Lee Graham and we are going to be talking about two early classics from the maestro of body horror, The Brood from 1979 and Scanners from 1981. What a double bill. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.